Welcome to Journey of a Story. We are talking to Joy Nelkin Weeder today, who's the author of The Passover Mouse, and uh, we're going to get right into it. We're happy to be here, and we were supposed to have you two years ago, That's Joy, right. before all that crazy stuff happened in 2020. Right. So welcome back. Thank you. Uh, Glad to be here. Yay. <laughs> so we're going to start off with sort of setting the scene of seeing you writing on a regular day, uh, just so viewers get an idea of all different ways people get their ideas down. So maybe kind of paint a picture of you writing. Where is it? Okay. How is it? Yeah. So I have my own office slash studio in the basement. Um, but it's a walkout basement, so I have a door and a window. It feels like a real room with beautiful light. And I have a drafting table on one side for where I do my illustrations. And then I have a desk with a computer, laptop, and a large screen um, where I write. And um, back in the day, I used to write on a typewriter. And then I had to transition to word processing. And um, in the beginning, I had to handwrite everything because I couldn't type and think at the same time. But now I just sit down on a computer and type Okay. Away. And so did you always, do you have like set times that you do that? Are you very, some people are very consistent or do you just when the mood moves you? No, my days are very flexible because I'm a freelancer. So if I have paying work, I have to do that first, but then I can write or, um, you know, the days flow a little differently every day. Okay, and that's always important because it's hard to find an author who is only an author. Usually, yes, it's that's your true. you know it's your passion on the side, right? Um, and the difference for you is you're also an illustrator, right? Um, so maybe talk a little bit about do you do your illustrations on computer as well, or do you see things in your head before you write them? How does that work? Um, well, I'm only dabbling in digital art right now. I did buy a um, professional iPad and iPencil, and I use a program called Procreate, but I wouldn't say I have any um, confidence with that yet. Okay. So I'm still working in traditional media, mostly watercolor and um, pencil. I'm also adding in pastel now, and I just like being able to feel it and use my fingers and it's just what I'm used to probably. Hmm. Um, I would say in the illustration field for children's books, it's still 50-50. Uh, half the people are in digital art, most of the young people coming up are digital, but there's still illustrators that work in traditional media. Okay. I do have to say though, I did not illustrate the Passover Mass. This was done by a, a wonderful Israeli artist named Shahar Kober and he did a great job. Okay, and so uh, in terms of getting the spark for the, the Passover mouse, uh, how did you come up with this idea? When did you come up? Was this something that just happened overnight or what's Definitely the story not there? overnight. <laughs> no, no, this is a very long journey to becoming this published book. Um, I actually started the original manuscript back in 2002 um, and the idea was born out of the research that I did for another book that I wrote and illustrated called The Secret Tunnel. Mm. And this is set in ancient Jerusalem. And in this book, the family has a Passover Seder. And of course, it would be different in ancient Jerusalem than today. So I had to do research about the Passover Seder. And um, so I read through the book of Jewish laws called the Talmud and they have an entire um, a volume just for Passover laws. Oh, wow. And as I read it, um, I came across this passage about uh, the rabbis discussing um, the possibility of a little mouse bringing bread into a house. At Passover, you're not allowed to have any bread. Okay. Um, no chametz, as the Hebrew word is called. And so people spend weeks and weeks and weeks cleaning out their houses. And if you spent all this time cleaning and a little mouse would bring some bread in, it would be a big problem. So as soon as I read that passage, I could just imagine this mouse running through a village and creating havoc. <laughs> and I wrote the story down. Um, in 2004, I sent it off to a competition for an unpublished picture book and it won the first prize. 
Oh, wow. And um, part of the prize was to have it reviewed by four editors, two non-Jewish publishers and two Jewish publishers. And I'm thinking, OK, this is it, my big break. And they all turned it down. Wow. So it was very disappointing and heartbreaking. And I kind of put it away in the back basement. So did they give you a re like did they give you any helpful critique on it or well, was it just sort of no <laughs> that's not some what we're did for. some um, some I, pro I I think I just never even heard back from but I remember one publisher said that they were interested only in contemporary stories and this is set in a shtetl a Jewish village in probably 1800s okay. and so they they weren't interested in the time period that the story was set in um, and for that was the Jewish publisher and the non-Jewish publisher felt that um, you know it was too Jewish for them <laughs> so you know and then I had another Jewish publisher where it wasn't Jewish enough so I was like you know caught you can't between please a rock and a hard place right? right and I, I just love the main character Rivka who's a widow and a lonely widow and wants to um, have the village help her with her Passover uh, preparations and she's the village is all brought together to help her through the antics of this mouse and I just love the character it was heartbreaking that um, she didn't get her break right and so I put everything in like a plastic bin and stuck it in the back of my basement and that sat there for years and years Wow and um, then and did you just forget about it? Did you move on or yeah, was it? so I moved on. I tried to do non-Jewish stories. I tried to find a more wider market. I did a lot of different things in between. Um, and then came uh, uh, an organization called PJ Library. It's a nonprofit. Okay. And they send books to uh, young kids, zero to eight, um, for free. And as, wow. if you sign up, then once a month, you get a free book of Jewish content. And um, it became a very popular program. Yeah. Now, was this around? Like, had this just come around recently, or how late? I don't long know ago? when they actually started, but I took notice of them about two. 2017, 2018. Okay. And what does PJ stand for? It's for pajamas. So it's like oh. nighttime stories. So okay. the idea is that the parents and the children That's are in cute. bed together and they read these Jewish stories nice. and continue the Jewish traditions through that vehicle. Okay. Yeah. And um, because it became so popular, they needed more content. So they were trying to incentivize creators to create more Jewish content and for publishers to publish more Jewish content. And because they had such a wide audience, publishers took notice. Right. And so in 2018, uh, PJ Library combined with SCBWI, which is the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, and they had a Jewish stories contest. Mm. And I thought, I have a story I could I could submit for this contest so I dusted her off and I brought her back to my critique group and and polished it up and sent it off and so quick question there yes polished published it or sorry polished it and sent it off did you just send the story or did you send the illustrations story. as well because I know you have a um, Originally, you had done the illustrations, correct? Yes, and I can, I can show you some of that. Um, but at that point, it was it was uh, the the contest was for the story. Okay. And so I just sent the manuscript. You know, I'm sure they had some kind of uh, rules about how to send it and what format. And mm -hmm. so I I sent it off in the format that they requested. And um, I wasn't really expecting anything. I, I kind of felt like, what do I have to lose, right? right? So I just sent it off. And then uh, I remember I was actually, I think at the library um, in Acton where I live, and I checked my phone, and here was this email that I won honorable mention in the SCBWI PJ Library Jewish Stories Award. And I just burst out into tears. Aww. I just cried. I was right. just so amazed and happy. and. 
felt like she was finally getting her due, Rivka, right. well, and, and her and mice. That's so much of the publication process is this roller coaster. It is a roller coaster. Uh, that's a good word for it. Yeah, so that was a very happy day. And um, as a result, I, I submitted it to an agent that I knew published Jewish stories. She's Jewish herself. And I thought, well, she's the right person. She's going to know what to do with this. And um, she responded right away. And she was interested in the story and asked me if um, I would work with her associate, a new person that she had brought on. And I decided to do that. And because I had an agent, they were able to submit it to the big five publishers. Random House is one of the big five, as they say. And you know, I would not have had access to those publishers without having an agent. Right. And then the editor fell in love with it. Um, and she asked my agent, would Joy be willing to have someone else illustrate it? Yeah. Um, so at that point, I had submitted to an editor with my dummy. OK. And, and you, a dummy, I'm going to stop. <laughs> yeah, explain that. <laughs> a dummy is like a mock-up of a okay. picture book. So you have every spread. It's usually sketch form, and they're not finished artwork. But that way, the editor can see where the page breaks are, page turns, and how, what kind of visuals um, you you see going with the text. Okay. Um, so I can show you. This is my, it originally was called Rivka and the Mice, not the Passover Mass. And this is my dummy. This is what a dummy looks like. Okay. And these are my sketches. And the intention was that I would write and illustrate the story. Okay. Um, but this kind of opportunity just doesn't come around every day, <laughs> as you know. Right. And I felt that the opportunity to be published by a big five publisher was worth um, giving up the illustrations. Right. And I also trusted that the editor would choose the right person because she knows the market and understands what's going to sell. And I decided to trust the process. And now I have this beautiful book. Yes. And uh, I was thinking of when you said, and maybe you can talk about this a little, uh, the fact that you won that contest. Yes. Uh, I'm thinking, oh, that's how you got published, but that wasn't. That was just even the first step to getting it your agent. It was the first step. Um, and how, you know, maybe talk a little bit about. Did you feel like that helped uh, for writers maybe entering a contest first versus trying to get an agent first? Is, would you recommend either way or? Well, I think um, having having um, won a contest or even getting a book contract offer. A lot of times people will submit to publishers, get an offer, and then say to this agent, hey, I have an offer. Will you represent me? Mm -hmm. So sometimes doing the footwork yourself will open those doors in a way that um, just querying blindly won't. Right. But I mean, it works both ways. So okay. you can't say this is the way you have to do it. It's just the way that can work. It's helpful. <laughs> uh, but I do know from the editor herself that that was a consideration. Ah. When she read my manuscript, she knew it had won a contest. And because PJ Library was interested in the story, they wanted to publish it for their program. So that helped what you call the P&L, the profit and loss mm -hmm. statement that she has to present to her publishing company in okay. order to get the green light. So I know it was a consideration and did help in the process. And so she probably assumed she'd be able to sell however many through PJ Library exactly. already. Okay. Exactly. Oh, and then PJ Library created their own edition, which was a paperback. So this is a hardback. They created a paperback version, and they included more information. So on the flaps of their copy, they had, um, for instance, they had arts and crafts projects. Like this little sock mouse yeah. was <laughs> included in the PJ Library edition. Yeah, and um, I actually have a link to the instructions on that on the PassoverMouse.com website. So if kids okay. want to create their own sock mice. So the website's PassoverMouse.com? Yep. Oh, OK. And now do you have your own author website as well? Or? I do. So they're, they're linked. Okay. I have a website 
for, in general for all my books and my illustration work. It's like a portfolio, and that okay. is jnweeder.com. Okay. And, and then the passivermouse.com is it's on like there. linked to okay. that. And would you recommend, did you have your pa website before you were published, or was that a result of becoming published, or what's your recommendation on, you know, a lot of writers don't necessarily have a website, right. maybe they just do Facebook or, or social media, any thoughts on that? Well, especially for illustrators, it's really important these days, because that is basically your portfolio. And when you are submitting to publishers, usually you send a link and say, you know, if you want to see my work, go to my website. In the old days, we had actual portfolios, and we would lug them around mm -hmm. for, to, you know, <laughs> different interviews in person. But those days are gone, and now you just direct them to your website. So I would say for illustrators, even pre-published, yes, definitely have a website. For authors, it's not as important, but it couldn't hurt. Okay, and now uh, you've published, you're celebrating, uh, and then you published, was it, Jan uh, when was that, November of 2019? It was actually January, January 2020. 2020. Yeah, and, and so then I had my <laughs> book launch at the beginning of February, Okay. and then everything shut down. Right. So I had all these in-person events um, lined up, and book signings and, um, you know, workshops with kids, and they all got canceled one so, by one, you know, ugh. because in the beginning we didn't know how long it was going to last. The first first one, no, we can't do it, and right. we'll see what happens with the next one, and it didn't happen. And so what was that transition like in terms of you're on this roller coaster, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you're just celebrating, and now everything's shut down. Did you pivot onto online right away or eventually, or how, did, how were you able to market it or you know, spread the word about it after that? Yeah, so there were a lot of options for online. Um, it was featured in different blogs that I could promote, um, different giveaway contests, giving away signed copies on Twitter, and um, I was part of a debut group, so we would promote each other's books. Um, first time, this is my first picture book, even though I've had other chapter books published, so I was a debut picture book author. And we helped each other to promote each other, and that helped a lot. Um, a lot of my critique partners who had books published during the last two years did virtual book launches. Um, I was able to do an in-person book launch, which was a yeah. lot of fun, but after that, pivoted to um, interviews, podcasts, blog posts, those kind of things that could be done online. Right, and how do you feel that went, especially connecting with the, the readers uh, instead of going into classrooms and things? Did you feel like you got to hear from them as much, or was it mostly their parents? Or? Well, one of the things I was really disappointed about was that I wasn't able to read it to kids, hmm. you know, and hear their reaction and find out how they liked it. Um, so then I participated in the World Read Aloud Day, okay. and it was on Zoom. And when is that? Um, Do you know? It just <laughs> happened recently. Okay. I think it was March something. Ah. February. February, okay. March. I can't remember exactly. Um, this was not the most recent one, but the year before I did World Read Aloud Day and um, connected with classrooms. Oh, nice. So the nice thing about having online is I could do one in Illinois. Hmm. You know, and um, uh, was able to hear the kids' questions and comments, and it was fun because I could tell they were really getting it. You know, hmm. they understood the story and had great questions, and um, then I got these beautiful thank you notes from them. So it was just so much fun to be able to really interact with the kids. That's right. that's why I did it. Right. In the first place. Exactly. And so have you been able to, with sort of things opening up a little, have you been able to go into libraries or classrooms yet, or are they still no, kind of holding off? No, I have not off? had yeah. an in-person book event yet. 
So that'll be an exciting day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. When that happens. Um, so maybe tell us a little bit about, I know you talked about this, the idea for this came from that other book that you were writing. Right. Uh, is the end product, uh, we saw the title changed. The title is changed. Is it very similar to how it began or did it, and for what reason did it take any different twists or did you take things in and out as you went? Um, yeah, so the story that I submitted to the publisher is pretty close. We did change the title. Um, the editor wanted to have Passover in the title so that people would know right away it was a Passover story. And I was like, brilliant, of course. You know, why didn't I think of that? But that's why um, I really wanted to go a traditional publishing route so I could have that team help mm -hmm. me and support me and get the best product available to kids. Um, the story itself didn't change too much. There was one change based on the illustrations, actually. When the illustration, um, the roughs came in, the illustrator had shown an interior scene instead of them being outside. It was the cobbler's house, and he had all these great you know, shoes half made all over the, the cobbler's house, and she loved the scene. So I had to rewrite that so that the characters were inside during that scene. Okay. But um, one of the main changes back in the day, I told you I worked on it back in like 2002, 2004. Um, Rivka's the main character, and she still is. Uh, but when I brought it to my critique group, one of the uh, critiques that they gave me was that um, there needed to be a child's perspective because it is a children's book. Mm. And most children's books have the main character as a child. Sometimes it's an adult, but that's not as common. So then I added in uh, the rabbi's son. And he is the one that solves the problem of, that these mice create. Ah. So that was one change that happened by getting critique and feedback. Right, and that's why that's so important, exactly. right? Exactly. Um, so as far as your other books that you've done before this, yeah. uh, was how did you, I mean, you didn't have an agent before Passover Correct. Mouse. That's what right. What was the process back then? Uh, did you just do sort of contract work, or did, how does that work? How do those other things? Well, there are some publishers who are open to unagented submissions. Okay. So that's the route I went until I had an agent. Um, excuse me. Um, the the first book that got published actually it, again it's it changes based on what the publisher's needs are. I submitted as a picture book. It's called The Great Potato Plan, and it's based on my family. Mm -hmm. And I sent it to a Jewish publisher, and she loved it, but couldn't publish it. And then some amount of time later, she contacted me again and she said, look, I've been thinking about your story. We have this new series of early chapter books and would you be willing to um, write this story as a chapter book? And of course I said yes. And then I was like, <laughs> ah, I've never written a chapter book. What do I do? Because <laughs> so, originally it was a picture book? Originally it was okay. a picture book with my own illustration, you know, the okay. whole thing. Um, and you know, again, I'm not, I'm not going to say no to an opportunity knocking on my door. So I'm like, sure, I can write it as a <laughs> chapter book. And then um, that book got published. And then um, I had the idea for The Secret Tunnel. And I sent it to my same editor. And she loved that idea. So I wrote that as a chapter book also. The nice thing about those two books is that I was able to illustrate them myself. Oh, really? Oh, OK. So those two books are written and illustrated by myself. And, and what's um, the learning curve for going the, from picture book to chapter book? I mean, that is kind of a big jump. It's a big jump. I mean, you know, picture books are what, 600 words, and the chapter book is 10,000 words. <laughs> um, some people find it actually easier to have more words. Picture books are very spare. It's almost like writing poetry. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be a challenge, actually, to tell a story in so few words and to leave room for the illustrations. Um, so in some ways, a chapter book can be a little bit liberating. You can put in description, and you can describe mm -hmm. the characters and the setting. And um, Was it liberating for you? <laughs> well, the other thing that was interesting, they're both historical fiction. So it okay. included a lot of research. Ah. It, that was a huge amount of 
time and effort to research the time period and the clothing and the customs right. and everything. The houses, you know, where did they go to the bathroom? I mean, just right. practical stuff like that. Um, and you had the illustrations, so maybe were you able to use those almost and describe in words what you had already written in picture form, or no? That was just well, it took what you know it was so much more detail than you would need for a picture book. Okay, that um, took a lot more research, but I found that fun. It was like a treasure hunt. You know, <laughs> it's like, well, I need to know this. You know, and how am I going to find that? And so you search and search, and then you're like. There it is. It's like right. finding a little treasure. And so are you still just considering picture books as your primary format first? Or did that interest you in perhaps doing middle grade or cha more chapter books at all? Um, I, as an illustrator, my love is to do picture books. And in fact, the next one, I have another dummy that's out there circulating. And I decided I'm, I'm not going to let someone else illustrate it this time because that's sort of the next level I'd like to reach is right. to have a picture book that I write and illustrate. Okay. So that's what I'm concentrating on right now. And are you with your same agent and everything well, similar? Interesting I know that, that sometimes that. those things can change. <laughs> yes, those things can change. Um, Actually, so my agent decided that um, she was not going to pursue picture books anymore. Uh. And then um, shortly after that, she decided she wasn't going to be an agent anymore. Okay. So, <laughs> so uh, she, she's not even an agent anymore. But I was left without an agent. And so the um, dummy that I'm now submitting is to agents trying to okay. get a new agent. Ah, all right. Um, so we're running out of time, as okay. we always do, even though we have so much more to talk about. Uh, but I thought that it would be nice to sort of wrap up with uh, maybe the best ofs <laughs> in terms of advice that you've learned on your journey of whether it's sparking an idea for a story, critiquing, any, any and all of the above of the process uh, for writers who either don't consider themselves writers, are intimidated by the whole process, or maybe they have a story and they're going to publish it and they just don't know where to begin. So I don't know if you want to throw any advice out there to them on any of those categories. Uh, well, I think given the story of this particular book um, that took so many years to come to life, that um, I feel like the message is to not give up. I mean, if you have a dream and that's really what you want to pursue, don't give up because it is a roller coaster. You win a contest, you don't get published. You have an agent, you don't have an agent. <laughs> you know, it's just that's the nature of publication. And um, I'm glad I didn't give up. That's you know? a perfect way to end it. Don't give up. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Joy. This really was such a treat, and I'm thanks so glad for having that me. I've been waiting for two years for <laughs> I this. Know. So, yay. It's been such a long wait in 20 years, right? What did you <laughs> say 2002? Yeah. Um, do you know when? Do you remember the month that you gave birth to this no, baby? No, <laughs> I don't remember the month, but I have, you know, on my on my files because I do write on a computer now. I know the year it was. It was okay, so written, yeah, this is a so. great year. I probably could go back and see the date, the actual month and day yeah. that that Maybe file have was a created, but I don't remember. Birthday party for it. Yeah, we could have <laughs> 20 years birthday. is a long time. So I think, you know, that's a great message is if you've done something and it doesn't work out, again, create some distance and. And the market changes. You know, right. when I first published, wanted to publish this. As I said, they only wanted contemporary stories, you know, and that changes. And I think the biggest catalyst was um, PJ Library mm -hmm. and their program and their need for great Jewish stories. And right. then it had a mark. All of a sudden, it had a market right. after 18, 20 years. So, congratulations! I'm Thank glad you. that it came out and that we're all able to enjoy it just in time for Passover this year. Just in time for Passover starts April 15th, so it's 
coming up, people. Okay. <laughs> Get your Passover mouse. <laughs> well, if uh, anybody else who would like to join us in the interview seat, uh, feel free to go to www.theroomtowrite.org and let us know if you're interested in talking about your writing process. Uh, thank you, Joy, and thank it was you. great to have you. Thank you so much, Colleen.